scattered across this nation, there are places abandoned, boarded up, mysterious. I will unlock their doors and make them yield their secrets. From an extraordinary hospital that pioneered the idea of free medical care for people living on the fringe of society. At a time when the public were paying to gawp at disabled people, the London hospital offered him sanctuary. In a world filled with danger. One of the things that's so chilling about the Ripper is that he dissected his victims, went looking for organs. Who was this man? To a remarkable 400-year-old prison that can reveal the story of British crime and punishment. If these stones could speak, I wonder what stories they'd tell me about the men, women, and children who eked out their sentences in cramped cells. Murder. I killed my mate. To top secret military facilities hidden away on our coast. I've arrived in the spookiest place with a random collection of buildings, a lighthouse, what appears to be a windmill, roofless bunkers, pagodas, where weapons of mass destruction were tested. Radioactive materials in ponds under liquid. That is unbelievable. This will be my hidden history of Britain. In this programme, I'm going in search of a ghost town in Wiltshire to uncover how a state decree wiped a thousand-year-old village off the map. Tough to go en masse, every one of them. How the ultimate sacrifice was made. It was quite horrific. There were 25 people killed, 71 wounded. And how citizens battled against the government to get back their homes. Two aeroplanes came out and buzzed us, and people had to lie down on the ground and how an English village was betrayed by the government. As a former Defence Secretary, I recognise that the government has a duty to protect our citizens and their property. But in exceptional times, our leaders may decide that the greater national good requires a personal sacrifice from you. I've set off to find the lost village of Imba. It's in the ancient heart of England, on Salisbury Plain, an area dotted with historic sites, such as Stonehenge and Bronze Age tombs. Even today, it's quite a long drive to Imber from the nearest town, Warminster. The only way to reach it is through a massive army training ground. All along the road, there are the hulks of tanks. Uh, these, I guess, have been used as target practice. There's nothing but battle-scarred country for miles around. Imagine, back in the day, this journey by horse, by carriage, on foot, must have been almost epic. So Imba is really very isolated. Imba is at least a thousand years old, mentioned in the Doomsday Book. But today, it's completely abandoned. To find out why, I need to meet the people who can unlock the mystery of this spectral place. This was once a happy and, I suppose, bustling village. Oh, we did have a policeman once. Some boys attacked him one day, poor old thing, and really hurt him. So we had no policemen after that at all. <laughs> On the Sunday, people would have been making their way up the hill towards the church. At weekends, the children would have played, doubtless, around here through the streets. We'd make um, houses of banks of hay. Children don't do that sort of thing now. She used to use a sauce bottle get some string and make hair to put in the top and then wrap it up and she'd have a doll. So hard to imagine now the thatched houses that visitors were so struck by, which obviously form such an important part of the memories of people who once lived here. Inside these ruined houses, there are only echoes of the distant past. I'm looking for clues, 
a window into the lives of the people who lived here. People used to eat things like rook pie and that sort of thing. I don't remember being hungry in Imber at all. Its isolation meant that Imber had to be self-sufficient. There was a schoolhouse, a post office, the village pub, and cottages for the farm labourers. Knowing that this was a farming community at first, I thought this building might have been for animals, but clearly it's not, because it has fireplaces. Here, there are two fireplaces back to back. I don't know, maybe a little uh, sitting room here and the kitchen the other side or the other way around. Uh, so, presumably, this was a, a labourer's cottage. And very often they had very large families. These rooms are small. You can imagine how cramped it would have been. There was 11 children in my mum's family. That's a lot. <laughs> my mum, Dolly, she came to live here when she was four years old with her parents and siblings. My granddad worked on a farm here. That's how he made a living. They lived in the street leading up to the church. And she said it, was, it wasn't a very big house, I don't think. They had to share a lot of the rooms, obviously, because there's a lot of them. Anne Lewis's mother, Dolly, lived in Imber for 10 years before the Second World War. Oh, she loved it here, yeah. She was very, very happy. And it was a lovely little village, and it was an ideal place to grow up, I think. She used to collect stones, and she'd put them in little holes in the bank leading up to the church, and she'd say they were her chickens. Imba was a little country in itself. Rich and poor lived cheek by jowl. The big house Imba Court was owned by the Dean family, the biggest farmers of the village. Today, the scarred husk can only hint at a lifestyle long gone. Of course, we used to do a lot of shooting in those days. We used to have shooting parties. And then they'd all change and go up for dinner, and then we'd play cards up to about 2 or 3 o'clock in the morning. So. This is the grandeur of Imber Court. I always feel rather outraged when I see a building abandoned and knocked about as old Imber Court has been. It's as though it had been subjected to an indignity. I feel almost as though, you know, it were a human. Quite a lot of attention was given to the detail here, lovely columns. This was the top house of old Imber Village. Completely ruined. There's not even much plaster left on the walls. But you can imagine this would have been rather an elegant hallway. Away from the big house, I imagine the social heart of Imber must have been the pub, the Bell Inn. One of the regulars there was Albert Nash, the village blacksmith. Albert's garden ran alongside the pub and he had an orchard out there. So in the summer, in the lovely evenings, they'd sit out there and Albert would knock on the window, he'd put the order in, and they'd get served through the window when they wanted another drink, just bang on the window again and out it came. <laughs> so how was life in this village? Albert Nash was the blacksmith here for 50 years and a big figure in Imber. I've come to meet his great-granddaughter, Jane Paget. I was told a lot about Albert by my grandmother, when, you know, other kids of, of that age were being told fairy stories. I got told by Gladys stories about Imber and the people who lived here and things that went on. I think Albert was uh, just a basic country blacksmith, really. He liked doing country things. He kept bees, he had a cottage garden, he grew his own vegetables. He made his own mead from the he, uh, leftover honey from the bees. He loved Imber. He loved the place, he loved the people, and they loved him, apparently. But a threat hung over Imber. The happy life of the villagers was about to be obliterated as their homes were wrenched away forever.
I'm in Imber in Wiltshire. I want to know why this ancient village over a thousand years old was deserted and devastated. What happened to the farm workers living in these broken cottages? Why did the wealthy family at Imber Court abandon its comfortable life? In the size of a room like this, you get an idea of its grandeur. Anyone for tennis? The exodus from Imber came in 1943. It was the height of World War II, but no German bombing raids would have targeted this peaceful corner of England. Among those who went was Albert Nash, the village blacksmith. Albert's great-granddaughter, Jane Paget, has brought me a revealing letter delivered to him by the War Office. On the 1st of November, everyone received a letter this letter, first thing in the morning. I regret to have to inform you that it is necessary to evacuate the major part of the department's Imber estate, including your dwelling. To this end, I enclose a formal notice to quit. How did that strike your great-grandfather? It was devastated. Uh, my great-grandmother, Martha, went out one day to the blacksmith smithy and found him slumped over his anvil crying because he had to leave and leave everything behind. They were all upset, Albert, his daughter, my grandmother. I remember her telling me she cried for the rest of the day to have to leave her home and the place that she'd grown up in, brought her children up in. That notice handed into every home in Imber was a thunderbolt. Since the War Office owned the land, the villagers were the army's tenants and the military summon them to the schoolhouse. John Williams is the last person alive who was present at that meeting 75 years ago. He'd arrived in Imber as a child the very year that the villagers were forced out. I came here as a seven-year-old with my mother when she was appointed as the schoolmistress. My mother wrote in the school report, and I have a copy of it. She writes, um, I dismiss the children at 10, 10 a.m. as school is needed for a meeting of military importance. And what was that meeting? The um, army officer said that um, the village, you'd have to leave the village before Christmas um, because it's wanted for, for the military because, as you all know, there's a war on. Did that argument work? That's why they went. But they went on the promise they could come back. And I well remember, um, you know, during that meeting, that promise, um, the army man at the front um, saying that um, we could come back. And you actually heard an army man say, you'll be coming back? Yes. And you can remember that? I can remember that. The whole population was forced to leave without compensation or help to find another home. They had to clear out in less than two months to be gone by the week before Christmas. At least they could hope to return when the war was over. The effects of the war raging across the world had somehow reached right into the beating heart of England. Imber today is shaken by the roar of army tanks on Salisbury Plain. I find a massive military exercise underway just outside the village. Good day. Good day. Good day. Good day. Looking forward to it. Oh, I am indeed. Good. Good. Good Thank you very much. The man in charge of this impressive array of firepower is Royal Marine Lieutenant Colonel Paul Maynard. Why are his troops here? The exercise is called Exercise Wessex Storm, and for us in 40 Commando, it's our validation exercise. Uh, we are coming to the end of a 12-month period of training to become the UK's very high readiness contingency force. And you're going to be operating around Imber? Uh, we are going to be operating around and indeed in, in Imber. Really? Yeah. And you've got some quite heavy tracked vehicles here. This is good terrain for that? Training is it? Salisbury Plain is designed for tracked vehicles, yeah. It's, it's superb. Uh, it's superb. The Almighty designed it for the purpose, did he? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, I hope you have a very good exercise. 
All around me, the engines of the vehicles are running. Piles of kit lie ready to go. Weapons, belts of bullets. Exercise Wessex Storm is about to kick off. And it clearly involves hundreds of vehicles and hundreds of men. And in a few moments, all of these will head out across the plain, taking an ember on the way. I see why Salisbury Plain was important to the army during the Second World War. The villagers were forced out at a crucial time in the fighting. By 1943, America had joined the war. Thousands of United States forces were gathering on the plain for a huge strike against the Nazis. But why do they need little Imber? Richard Osgood is a senior archaeologist at the Ministry of Defence. So why were the residents expelled? Richard, here we are with a lovely view of St Giles's Church in Imber. Give me an idea of what the village must have been like once World War II started. It must have been a very peculiar place. And uh, I've got this map that dates from the Second World War, from 1940, in fact. And the area in red is the area owned by, by the War Department. And if you look over on the west, you'll see the small enclave, Imber. Heavens, it's absolutely in the midst right of Right in the middle of the training area, and that's marked as out of bounds to the military. So it's a small oasis of village life in a, in a, a colossal area of high-intensity training. All the way across the map, artillery danger zone, artillery danger zone, uh, and, you know, the colour red is very expressive. It tells you this is a dangerous area. What kind of life were the villagers leading, do you think? Well, I think probably quite a precarious one in many ways. Getting in and out of the village must have been incredible. You could only get in and out a couple of times a day because there is live firing going on all around it. Do you think the War Office had become concerned by this stage of the war? I think so. And, I, and one particular incident that took place on the 13th of April 1942 made it palpably obvious that you really couldn't have people living in the middle of the training area. This is a military training exercise that takes place um, about four miles from where, from where we're standing, where two flights of aircraft are detailed to come in and attack various targets that have been laid out on the ground. And this is in, in readiness for a visit of uh, Winston Churchill and General Marshall from the American Army. Um, so they're doing a practice run, effectively. They have a large number of dignitaries that are, are, are there. They're all, they're all military characters. There's a brigadier. The aircraft that were brought in for the demonstration, it's six Spitfires, six Hurricanes. Uh, they strafe various targets that are in the, in the vicinity, meant to be representing vehicles. The last plane, it was a Hurricane, was piloted by an American chap. He was a flight sergeant, William McLachlan. Um, and he approaches and attacks what he thinks was the target on the ground. But it's, in fact, the crowd. With what consequence? It was quite horrific. There were 25 people killed, including the brigadier that was watching, 71 wounded. Uh, there are accounts from people living in Imber of uh, hearing this firing going on, um, and then a lot of blue lights for the emergency vehicles trying to rescue those that had been badly wounded in the, in the incident. So, um, real repercussions. The terrible accident that Richard told me about became known as the Imber Incident, and I can imagine that it would have added powerfully to official concern for the safety of the villagers. But when I saw that map, it came home to me that Imber was an island in a sea which was a military training ground, and keeping the villagers in their homes was just inconsistent with the needs of the war effort. At the height of the war, Britain was still in crisis. Tough decisions had to be made. So the War Office uprooted the families of Imber. But after the war was won, the villagers faced a new and even tougher battle 
a desperate fight to reclaim their homes. If you please, two aeroplanes came out and buzzed us, and people had to lie down on the ground. True. It was ridiculous. <laughs> we were treated like criminals. I'm in Imba, a village where families had their homes ripped away at the height of World War II. The families believe they would return after the war. But this thousand-year-old village is dead and deserted now, apart from the tanks that circle its perimeter. Everywhere in the village you find the debris of military training exercises. That is the pin out of a hand grenade, and these are bullet clips which together form the ammunition belt for a machine gun. So much of picturesque old Imba has been completely wiped out. The thatched cottages, the post office, even Albert Nash's smithy have all gone. These buildings with uh, brick uh, are probably original, but then all these ones that have a breeze block they were built by the military. Difficult to imagine the children playing or the, I don't know, the milk churns being delivered in the morning. Yet, at the end of World War II, most of the village was still intact. The villagers were eager to return and to restore their neglected homes. They waited anxiously for news from the war office. In 1947, word came. Final sentence of death on Imba has been passed. The Norman church will never again see its parishioners, for the pre-doomsday village is to remain a permanent battle school, says the War Office. The villagers' protests were in vain. The government decided to exclude them from Imba forever. The more that I looked into the story of Imba, the more I was convinced that things had gone wrong and promises were not kept. David Johnson is a former local councillor who joined the villagers in a campaign to get Imber back. I got more involved because the villagers' attitude to uh, government of whatever complexion is we'll never trust the government's word again. If I say to you, Michael, when those people were evacuated, they left provisions in their kitchens so that they would be able to return. I contacted one of the soldiers that helped to evacuate the village, a man called Richard Madigan. He was told by his superiors, uh, an army major, that they were to tell the villagers that they would be back in six months or at the end of the war at the latest. And of course it never happened. And he, he was emotional about the whole thing, Michael. And that's interesting because, I mean, he went through the war, I dare say he saw yeah. all sorts of things. Why do you think the fate of Imber stuck in his mind? The fate of Imber stuck in his mind because he felt it was a breach of faith. In which he unwittingly had which been involved. Which he unwittingly had been involved in. That sense of betrayal just grew and grew in the years after the war. This is something that a democratic state should never, mm. ever have done. It was a thing which even the Germans would not have done. The villagers' anger at having their homes snatched away erupted in 1960. They staged an illegal invasion of Imba. 2,000 people joined them in a march across Salisbury Plain. They demanded that the village be given back. So we marched all up through here in great style, but Profumer at that time was Minister of War. He apparently gave the order that we should be stopped. So, if you please, two aeroplanes came out and buzzed us, and people had to lie down on the ground. True. It was ridiculous. I mean, we were treated like criminals. In 1961, in the face of protests, the War Office made a small concession. They would open the village three days a year so that people could visit their abandoned homes. But for the other 362 days, the village remained a training ground for soldiers. Imba was in the not-so-gentle hands of the army, 
their highly realistic training exercises smashed houses, the school, the pub. For the army, one war had finished, but another conflict had begun. Fear of the Soviet Union during the Cold War meant that Imba was still needed. I think, you know, for a moment we would think during, um, during an exercise, we'd think of the people who used to live here and imagine what it was like to be in that house or walking down that street before we were there. Mark O'Reilly is a former officer of the Royal Irish Hussars who trained as a tank commander at Imba. So how could a small Wiltshire village help to ward off a Soviet invasion of Western Europe? I used to be involved with an exercise called Exercise Phantom Bugle in the late 80s, and it was based on the Cold War. So you were rehearsing for a possible battle? On the fields of Germany, the, the, the Rhine, the British Army, the Rhine was stationed there, and that was their primary role, was to hold back as much as possible to allow reinforcement from the UK. And this was one of the best areas for us to train. So, what's the scene as the attack begins? OK, initially, this is, uh, this is where we'd be holed up, and in a building such as this, you would have um, infantry um, with machine guns located on the windows, covering certain fields of fire. You're firing blanks, but the yeah. noise is presumably horrendous. Absolutely. As the enemy comes through, there's a combination. In those days, we used um, thunder flashes, which are incredibly loud, smoke grenades, and, of course, the noise of blank and people shouting, commanders shouting to each other, talking on the radio, there's smoke everywhere. What's the impact on the, on the soldier, perhaps the fairly inexperienced soldier, of all this noise and chaos? You're taking him out of his comfort zone. There's loads of stuff that goes on in the head and this sort of thing, and it, they get so carried away, so enthused by what they're doing. It's absolutely amazing. Adrenaline, absolutely adrenaline, amazing. Imba had been mocked up as a German village under attack from Soviet troops during Mark's training in the late 1980s. By then, the hamlet had withstood 40 years of dummy warfare, and that had taken its toll. Imba Court, the village manor house, still bears the scars of war. Wherever you go, you find spent cartridges. There was once uh, an oak staircase here. Reputedly, it was riddled with bullets, machine guns, supposedly. And it's now been replaced, anyway, with this metal job. Not quite the elegance of the original. You can see from all the photographs that Imber Court had a third floor, and here you can see a temporary metallic roof with these girders has been put in place. So the building has been done terrible violence. Once the military had a hold of Imba, it never let go. As the army moved from one war zone to the next, so did Imba. When troops were sent to Afghanistan, Imba caught was pressed into service again and reinvented as a Taliban compound. Well, the first time I saw Imber Village, it was fully shot up then, I've got to say. It had been... Uh, had a little bit of hardware into it. Ex-soldier Chelsea Hall served in the Royal Anglian Regiment in Afghanistan in 2007. I wonder how his training at Imba prepared him for war. Chelsea, what memories does Imba hold for you? In this house, we had a, um, all these rooms would have been utilised with soldiers sleeping upstairs, and they would have been conducting operations um, in the local area, as they were expecting to do in Helmand once uh, they arrived. Uh, what does Imba have to do with Helmand? I mean, they, they, they don't look like similar environments. No, absolutely not. But um, Imba Court has um, a very prominent set of walls around it, you would have observed. And in theatre, we come across compounds, which they would actually cut a, a, a bar mine in half and prop them against these mud and straw compound walls and blow a hole in them, so that way our soldiers could get in. And the walls around Imba Court were actually very good to practice dry drills on it. 
What is this footage we're seeing on the walls? OK, here? this is uh, footage in Afghanistan. They're actually defending their base against an attack. And that's that guy just throwing a grenade over there. They're literally the enemy is the other side of that wall. And they'll be falling back on the sort of training that they've been Absolutely, doing in yeah. the UK. Everything that they are doing now has its basis on the training they received here in Imba. Looking around Imba Court, fascinating clues reveal how the building has been used by troops stationed here. This little room with the tiling, I'm guessing, is a washroom for the guests to use. They wouldn't have to use the bathrooms of the family. Nice modern convenience at the beginning of the 20th century. And the gate, well, I'm assuming the army put that in, so during their exercises, I suppose, if they caught any of the enemy, they could uh, <laughs> shut them up in the bathroom. What the army calls the Imba firing range is still used for live ammunition practice. So the village remains firmly shut, apart from the occasional public access days. It seems unlikely that the army will ever let go. How does the top brass justify keeping Imba and the countryside around it so closed off? Senior Army Officer Brigadier Neil Dalton is the man in charge. Good morning. Good to see you. And you. So you've got some fairly chunky exercises go on on Salisbury Plain. We do. Um, how compatible is that with the, with the public being around? Obviously, a large military exercise involves um, potentially live firing. You'll have tanks. Tank weighs 70 tonnes. It moves at speed. It's a very risky vehicle to be around. So when you're here firing your tank shells and so on, it's not, not a great moment to take Rover for a walk? It's not. No, no. So, um, absolutely. So if you come into the plane, any of the areas around the plane, if you see the flag up, don't go in. That means no public access. Is there, is there any way you can think of to resolve these conflicts between the rights of citizens and, and the needs of the state? Well, I think um, it, that's a very important issue. It's absolutely right that we should allow access to this huge area of the countryside that we manage. But what we have to balance is the requirements of military training against public access and against public safety. But the protest against the army occupation of Imba has never stopped. We were very moved by the story of the villagers. Uh, they were evicted with a promise from the military that uh, they could return. And of course, that promise was broken. Greenham Common campaigners targeted Imba in the 1980s. I remember that the Greenham Common camp was a thorn in the government's side when I became a member of parliament. One in non-violence takes responsibility for all of one's actions, and that means arrest and a court case and imprisonment. I'm going to meet a political activist who would have been my sworn opponent when I held power in the Ministry of Defence. Beth Juna was a Greenham Common protester many times imprisoned for her direct actions. Hello, Beth. Hello. I'm Hello. Michael. Nice to see you. Good to see you. And you. One summer night, Beth and three other women invaded Imba. Their aim to stop an important live-firing army exercise. It was the 14th of June, 1988. Well, what, what happened? Uh, we walked through the dark, this was one or two o'clock in the morning, and here, Michael, we found an army exercise. Mm. There were jeeps at the side of the road here, their headlights on, uh, the light lighting up this part of the road. And there were some squaddies over here uh, brewing a cup of tea. So we walked right through the middle of this army camp. They, they didn't stop us. Uh, we think that they saw us. But what uh, sense did they make of us when they saw four women walking through the middle of the camp? Beth chose this little Wiltshire village as a platform to protest against the British Army. 
Would her risky mission to disrupt a major military exercise succeed? I'm in Imba, a village where families were forced out by the army during the Second World War. It's been used for training troops ever since and become a focal point for protest. In 1988, Beth Juna and three other women campaigners invaded Imba. They aimed to stop an army live firing exercise by putting their own lives at risk. So, it's this extraordinary summer night in 1988, and you're picking your way through the village. Did you see um, anybody uh, around here? Uh, you know the feeling uh, that someone is going to put their hand on your shoulder at, at any moment and tell you to stop and arrest you. Uh, it was that kind of feeling. Should we go on up towards the church? Yes. Was the door then not locked? No, this door was open, and we just turned the latch and it was open. And in you went? In we went, yes. It's amazing that Beth and her friends got so far. They could have been arrested or accidentally shot at any moment. It's a lovely church, isn't it? Very, it's very historic. An absolutely beautiful church. Later, she wrote about her memories of that night. We remained in and around the church for nine hours, then decided to make ourselves known by entering the churchyard and playing music. Well, yes. that must have caused a surprise. Yes, and it flushed the army out of those buildings we passed. What were you the playing? Village. We were playing a folk tune, and the music uh, flushed out the army. And so were you arrested? Yes, we were. Uh, the four of us were arrested, taken away, and uh, by the MOD police taken up to um, West Down Camp and processed there. <laughs> so, you went, so you went to prison? Yes, yes, we did, yes. How does it feel coming back to Imba today? Uh, very emotional and to see the neglect, the, the damage, the bullet shells all up, up the path to the church, uh, it, it's heartbreaking. I don't think Beth and I are exactly political soulmates, but her audacious occupation of the church in the middle of a military operation leaves you no doubt that she is sincere. And the fact that she chose to do it fully 45 years after the evacuation of Imba, suggests that this place has a magnetism born of its sad history. The church in Imba is the only building still intact. It's the one place that the public is allowed to enter, but access is restricted to just three days per year. St Giles's is the heart and soul of the ruined village. Families congregate at an annual service to remember all that's been lost. Anne Lewis's mother, Dolly, lived in Imba as a child. Anne regularly brought her back to the church services. She loved coming back every year, maybe more than once, sometimes a year, whenever it was open. How many years then was it that your mother was able to come back year after year? Um, I think it was probably about 45 years, roughly, that she came back <laughs> as a sort of pilgrimage, I suppose, every year, yeah. Yeah, she'd show us the things as, she, as we walked down the street, where the little different houses were, where the farms were, where the shop was, where the allotments were, uh, where they used to live when she was growing up. When do you think her last visit was? Probably in 2004. How old was she by then? And she'd have been in 90. She showed quite a commitment to Imba, didn't she? She did, very much so, yes. Anne's husband, Gordon Lewis, joined her and Dolly on their visits to Imba. I think Imba is the story of freedoms won, freedoms lost. 
We won the war, but for the people of Imber, they lost the freedom to live in their homes. So you have come on open days to the village over the years. Uh, why do you do that? I think it's part of keeping the village alive. Uh, when I first... Forgive, forgive me, the village is not alive. How can, how can you keep alive a village that has no-one in it? Keep the memory of the village alive, keep the ghosts of the buildings alive, if you like. It will never become a village again as it was. But if I use my mother-in-law as an example, before she died, she would bring not just her children and her in-laws, She'd bring her grandchildren. She'd even started to bring her great-grandchildren to Imber. So in many ways, the village may have died, but the memory of the village will always live as long as there are people to pass on that memory. What is it that draws these loyal visitors again and again back to Imber? Have you visited the grave quite a lot? I come when the village is open and put flowers on the grave and tend it. So how often would that be? Um, probably about four times a year. Oh, really? Yeah. So you're pretty devoted to your oh, yeah. great-grandfather. Absolutely. Albert Nash, the village blacksmith, died away from his beloved Imber. His body was brought back to the village to be buried. In memory of Imber, Blacksmith Albert Nash, 1875 to 1944. So how did Albert die? They'd been gone less than six weeks, and my grandmother, my great-grandmother Martha, woke up in the middle of the night one night, and Albert was walking around the bedroom. And she said to him, Albert, what are you doing? Get back into bed. It's the middle of the night. And he said, I'm going home, Martha. And she said, you are home, Albert. Get back into bed, which he did. And when she woke up in the morning, he was dead in the bed beside her. Mm. And the doctor said he could find no reason for his death other than he died of a broken heart. Do you still grieve or do you still feel resentment about the moving of the population of the village out? I don't feel resentment about moving them out. There was the war on and the village was needed. And people were being displaced all over Europe at the time. Mm. What I feel resentment is about that they were led to believe that they could come back and they never were allowed to. Basically, I think that was a, a, a sweetener that was given to them so that they went easily. People who were being displaced all over Europe, it, it was happening because of the enemy. This was done by their own government, and I think that was what hurt a lot of people and still rankles, to be truthful. Imba holds the villagers' descendants in a magnetic grip. Here were the deep roots of their families, wrenched out by government decree. St Giles's church dates to the 1200s. So when Imba was evacuated in 1943, that interrupted centuries of history cutting across generations of villagers. When they weren't allowed back at the end of the war, they felt double-crossed, and a whiff of injustice and treachery gives the place a mournful and disturbing feel. It's vital for training, says the army, and it would be an unsustainable island of civilian life in a boiling sea of military pyrotechnics. It's the classic citizen versus state conflict, and the dereliction of the village today leaves you in no doubt about who won. So far, at least, for history never ends.